Hi and welcome to my production studio. Today's topic is all about cameras. Cameras that I've used and owned myself going right back to when I was a little kid. And also the cameras that I've used to film wildlife, so camcords and other types of cameras. We're starting with cameras and going right back to when I was at least, at the very least, eight years of age. That's when I suddenly discovered that, yeah, I was into wildlife. I loved watching wildlife documentaries and I dreamed of making my own. I wanted to be able to photograph wildlife and film every bit of their lives. My first experience with photography was when my family used to go on holidays. Dad would bring the camera out and take snapshots of us down the beach or wherever we were. And I'd be right at his side nagging him to let me take a shot as well. I wanted to take shots of wildlife, not the family, birds, seagulls, you know, anything that was going on. It really interests me and I wanted to take my own shots and see what they would be like when we got home. Of course, had no idea what I was doing, but it was Instamatic cameras that Dad was into. He didn't know anything about photography neither. He just wanted to take that shot. Hopefully the camera would do the rest. So they were Kodak cameras, film cameras. I'm not quite sure what size of film he was using, around 25 mils or even smaller. So that's my first experience with photography, nagging my dad, letting me have a shot. When I turned 12, we shifted onto a farm that my dad had bought. I was in heaven. There was a forest next door and I spent hours and hours in there just sitting listening and watching nature, dreaming of my own camera. Eventually I started working and earning some money and I saved up for an SLR. I cannot remember the brand name. All I can remember was what it looked like and that it uh, was a 35 millimeter camera. So it would have either been a Canon or a Kodak. They're the only two that I would have chosen. But yeah, I can't find it online. So yeah, I don't know the brand, but it taught me a hell of a lot more than the other cameras did. It had a light meter in it and other things that allowed me to see how I could properly expose my images. And I learned a hell of a lot over the years. I was right into motocross racing, so I'd take photos of the events. And also uh, eventually I'd start up scuba diving and I'd take photographs of my friends setting up with their gear. So it, it taught me a hell of a lot. Now with film photography, it was a close shop as far as learning anything. So from sharing, other photographers sharing their knowledge didn't exist. The only way you could find out about learning about how a camera works was from buying a, an expensive book, expensive lessons, or getting an apprenticeship. If you were extremely lucky, they were pretty rare, an apprenticeship with a wedding photographer or a portrait photographer. For wildlife, it, that sort of thing really didn't exist. But that's the only way you could learn. Close shop, and they held on to their secrets pretty tightly, photographers back then, because they wanted to, you know, run a business. They didn't want tons of people getting into the industry and lowering the price of, the, of uh, them going and doing weddings and things like that. Not like we get these days with the internet, everything is shared. So I had that camera for quite some years. I eventually took up scuba diving and I wanted a camera that I could take underwater. I bought this little yellow brick. This is a photograph of similar camera to it. I don't think it was that brand. I just can't remember what it was. Awesome little camera. It went down to about 15 to 20 meters. And I learned how to use a camera underwater. Can't use a flash directly on. It, you just get flashback from all the little particles in the water. But I got some really good results every now and then and just had an, having a ball with photographing underwater. 
Well, eventually the aperture seized up. I played with it trying to get it to work, but it just wouldn't work, so it was a throwaway. After that, I bought my first SLR underwater camera, a Nikon. So that was amazing having all these adjustments we could do underwater. I also bought a light meter because it didn't have one built in. It did come like that later on after a few models with light meters, but I had to buy one with a little underwater case that it came in so that I could get my exposure right. Awesome camera to use. Also came with a strobe. So an arm that came up so we could get the flash on a different angle. I had a lot of fun with it, but it was a bit of a pain because we used to do a lot of jumping into the water off the rocks. So to save time walking all the way around to get down onto the sand and then slowly work your way out into the ocean, we'd get closer to where we had to go by getting on the flat rock surface, wait for the right wave to come, Every third to fourth wave would be right. It'd swell up nice and high, and it'd take you out gently. So we'd just time it, jump in, and then drop down. Just get out there and have fun, and hopefully not smash it on the rocks when we're coming back in. In 1988, I heard the word digital photography, and I just had this sixth sense that it was gonna open a massive door for me. Help me to become more professional with my photography. So I hanged on to that film camera for a few more years. Then I started to see these cheaper sort of you know, digital cameras that were eight megapixels. And so I bought a little Instamatic uh, Canon camera. You turn it on and the lens would uh, pop out. So it was a handy little camera just to learn. That's all I got it for, was just to learn about digital photography. So I had that for some time and then it jammed up and stuffed up. And then I bought a Conic Minolta. So that was another cheaper camera, it was about $500, but it had a, a zoom lens on it. So I could photograph my kids at the beach, just like my dad was doing, taking family snapshots. Again, that helped me to understand how to work things on a computer and edit them, do funny things with them. So using Photoshop, that, that started around that sort of time as well. So we're talking somewhere around 2005, somewhere around there. 2009 comes around and digital photography finally comes of age. We're getting really high megapixels now. We're getting cameras that are better than film cameras with the detail, and yeah, there's just so much to love about them. They're just fantastic now. For me, the Canon 5D Mark II, which I still own, marks that event. It had a hell of a lot of hype when it first came out. Wedding photographers, portrait photographers, absolutely loved it. And when you go on to YouTube in them days, that's when we started to see a lot more things about photography and we could learn a bit from them. But wedding photographers and portrait photographers, there wasn't anything about wildlife at that stage. We had this arrive on my doorstep and I shot out the bush to take my first photograph. I was bitterly, bitterly disappointed with the camera. The focusing system in here is crap. It hunts like mad, especially in a forest environment. It has no idea what you want to take a shot of. That was very frustrating. I racked off 50,000 clicks in less than a year. I went berserk. I wanted to learn. I wanted to catch up on everything that I've been missing out with, with film cameras. Such slow learning. So from when I was eight years of age to right up until I, before I started buying digital cameras, I'd only learnt a tiny, tiny amount. So my knowledge went from down here so well beyond up into the sky once I started using this camera. Now because we didn't have anything about wildlife on YouTube, I had to learn myself. And it took me quite some time, probably about somewhere around 30,000 images before I started to realize what shutter speed I needed to be able to freeze the action with fast moving subjects, so birds and small animals. That's where I got my knowledge from with using shutter speeds and uh, how to set the camera up with exposure to go with that 
high shutter speed. And with the 5D Mark II, you couldn't go over an ISO of 500, so it was very limiting because of noise. We didn't have software on the computers the, back then to be able to deal with that like we have now. So we were restricted in lighting conditions that we could work in. Standard lens that I had on there was a gold band 70 to 300 millimeter lens. Drove me nuts, the two of them together, they were horrible. Bought the old version of that and it uh, calmed things down and focused a little bit better. But yeah, a lot of times manually focusing on my subject. The 5D Mark II didn't just educate me, it also taught me a couple of valuable lessons. The first one being, don't get sucked into the hype when a new camera comes out. Wait till the dust settles and then the truth will come out whether it's a worthy camera for you to buy. The second one is how to work around the faults that cameras have. And it made me a much better photographer because it had that terrible focusing system. But it wasn't just the focusing system, it was where the focus points were positioned as well that made me frustrated and angry because composition wise, you had to zoom back out and do that in post because all the focusing points, nine of them were all clustered in the center. I do owe this camera a lot and it educated me in so many areas. That learning, I had to learn myself how to photograph wildlife. Like I've already said, YouTube, there was nothing. There was no one to help me with all that. It was all trial and error. Keep plugging away, take thousands of images, study them, work things out myself. So it certainly ended up being a love and hate relationship with it but it gave me a massive education in all sorts of areas. So I am very grateful to it, even though it sits in the cupboard and I don't use it. <laughs> I eventually bought the 7D Mark II. Amazing relief from this camera with the focusing system. It was just fantastic with all the adjustments that we could do. So finally we get a camera that, that uh, does what I want and give me fantastic autofocus. But after a couple of years of using it, I really did miss not having a 35 millimeter sensor. Just didn't have the detail that I really wanted. The, the thing too with these two sensors was that uh, starting to photograph the agile antichinus, the very tips of the hair, would get like an aliasing effect. And I would later find out that it definitely was the sensors on them. So it was a little disappointing as well. But yeah, I definitely wanted to go back to a full frame sensor, but I just had to wait. The 5D Mark III came out, wasn't much of an upgrade at all, so that wasn't worth buying that camera. The 5D Mark IV came out, that was tempting. Very tempting for me, of course, I always wanted a 1DX, but out of my price range. But that was a camera still, the 5D Mark IV, that was really what I wanted this camera to be. So I thought, no, I'll just hang on for a bit, and then we start hearing about mirrorless cameras. Now, it took a while for them to come of age, that is for sure. And Canon sat back because there's a lot of problems with focusing with mirrorless cameras. So that was my main concern, always my, my main concern. I want a focusing system that works brilliantly, not one that hunts. So it did take some time before Canon finally came out with the R6 and the R5. So I bought the R6 straight away, brilliant focusing system, eye detect and all sorts of things that we've got with those cameras, it's just amazing. Got some fantastic shots of the Antichinus, so the Agile Antichinus, the Dusk Antichinus, and the Yellow Footed Antichinus. I'm noticing the difference between the sensors with the fur. So all of a sudden, all those problems with aliasing on the very tips of the fur, where they're almost see-through, has gone. And when it comes to filming, the R6 had a great image, but the dynamic range just wasn't there. I would have kept that camera had really good dynamic range. I wasn't fussed on buying the 
the R5, but it was a consideration. But I thought, I've got the R6, we'll just hang on to it and see what happens. Then eventually, the R5C comes onto the market. And I just thought that camera would be awesome for filming. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Filming wildlife and the cameras or the camcords that I've used throughout that time. Well, my first experience with filming wildlife came in the early 90s. And that wasn't with a film camera using film itself. It was with tapes. I bought a Toshiba Beta camera. So it was a small tape about that size that fitted into it. And I bought that camera so that I could film underwater. It had a housing that I bought come with it, which was a soft bag. So it was hospital strength, silicon based. And you locked the top and tightened up some bolts so that it wouldn't leak. You'd go down to about 20 meters. You couldn't go any deeper than that because it would just compress the camera so much with the pressure that the buttons, it would turn itself on and off, on and off. So once it got down to that depth, I would release a rope that it was on and let it go up so I could go down and have a look what was under the crevices and things like that. So trying to catch crayfish and things. Great camera gave me some awesome stuff. I learnt so much about using a camera underwater. So I used that bag with the camera for quite some years until it started leaking and ruined the camera. I eventually moved on from scuba diving and started really getting into studying wildlife. The Agile Antichinus come along and I was desperate for a camcord that would give me amazing results. And I chose the XF300. Amazing camera at that time. It's only full HD, so 1080p, but it was giving me amazing results. I learned how to film wildlife with this camera. It taught me a hell of a lot. Great focusing system. Didn't hunt too much. Uh, there was a little problem here and there with, uh, wasn't hunting, but you'd get this sort of haze look about it. So it was doing something funny with the focusing system in certain conditions. But otherwise, amazing. But of course, 4K comes along. This was obsolete. The footage that I was, going, that I was getting out of this was no longer good enough for me. Well, hi and welcome to my office and the second part of my review on the UX180. I finally got myself an infrared light so I can check out this camera in infrared mode. Now we're limited to what we can actually control on the camera when we're in infrared mode. We can use whatever resolution we like, whatever frame rate we like. Moving the infrared light to one metre away from the subject has helped a lot, cutting down the noise and grain quite substantially. There's a couple of things on the camera that I'm really unhappy with. The first one being the internal fan is quite loud. The onboard microphone picks it up quite easily, especially when things are quiet in the forest or in, inside in a small room. Rendering the microphone useless. It's yeah, unusable. The other thing is slow motion. Lack of detail. Terribly milky looking. So it makes the clips unsellable. Now I'm placing this camera in the marketplace not as a pro camera. It just doesn't hit the mark. It's an overpriced consumer camera and it all comes down to that cheap sensor that they've put in here. If you'd have put a bit of love into this camera and put a good sensor in there Panasonic, this would have been your best seller for 2017. There's some great things on here but the sensor just drags it down. So we move on from that to the XF400. This is a camcord that just uh, was amazing. The size of it, it was designed for jibs, but it had a unique feature that I really loved about it. And that is 
a sensor pickup for your remote on the screen. <laughs> Why don't every camera have that? You know, even our uh, mirrorless cameras. Why haven't they got on the flippy screen pick up for a remote control? Because we're behind the camera, in front of it, at the side of it, and we need con to be able to control them from wherever we're standing, right? Doesn't that make sense? Well, apparently, this is the only camera in existence that has that. So it's awesome camera, got some amazing results with it. Infrared built in, so I use it for filming inside my nesting boxes, getting that live action as it happens. So it's been an amazing tool to use. Love it, still use it for that purpose. Don't use it for anything else now because we moved on from this one. I did have a small stint with the XF605. Bitterly disappointed with that camera, regardless of uh, what everybody else says about it. For me, the noise in the background in really good lighting conditions was an absolute killer for me. So I end up buying what's filming me right now, and that is the Canon R5C. Brilliant camera. Don't think. I'll be buying another camera to replace it. It's just amazing, pretty much future-proofed, for me anyway. Amazing dynamic range when we're filming. We get amazing autofocus, so I would like Animal Eye Detect. It doesn't have Animal Detect at all, but it's got other tools that I use. So it's an awesome camera, and it's, yes, as far as filming goes, and there's something happens to it, won't be replacing it for filming wildlife. The detail is unbelievable. Because I have a YouTube channel, I want to have cameras that are fun. So I end up buying an action camera, and that is the DJI Osmo action camera, the first version. Amazing little tool. Man, it's so much fun. The only thing that's really annoyed me completely with this is not having any control over the audio. It's all automatic, you can't do anything about it, but that's the way it is, and also no headphone jacks. So if there's any problem with the audio blowing out, I've got no idea, because it sounds nice when you put it to your ear to listen back to it. So I have to wait until I get home to find out whether there was any problem with it. That's time to upgrade. Don't like the three version that's there at the minute, but the fourth sounds awesome. We get controls over the audio. Doesn't have a headphone jack, but we get control over the audio finally, manual controls. So I'll be buying that camera once it comes out to Australia. I'm not going to pre-order it. I'm gonna wait and see because I've learnt from the hype of things. I wanna see it in the hands of the common people. Let's see what they say about it because it's being beefed up as being an awesome camera and outdoing GoPro in all areas almost. So yeah, let's wait and see. Awesome camera for B-roll and uh, yeah, my YouTube channels is an A camera. Just been amazing little tool to use. I love it. Won't be throwing it out until it dies, all right? It's gonna stick with me. Is that second camera sitting around. Now the other thing that I use to film wildlife, 24 hours a day in my nesting boxes are trail cameras. Had quite a few brands over the years. Having them out in the forest all the time, they tend to only last about three years and then they get moisture on the, the guts of it and they short out. I try not to buy expensive stuff. I've always had the cheaper ones, but uh, last year I decided to go for a, a browning, the more expensive stuff. I'm disappointed with this. It's not very good at all in my nesting boxes. It's a little bit harder to work out whether a male or female antikinus is coming down into the nest. Uh, and a lot of other things. It's... I think we come to the end now. I can't remember any other cameras that I've missed. So I hope you enjoyed this, going back through the history of my experience and of owning cameras with camcords, and uh, DSLRs, film cameras, mirrorless cameras, the works. 
that's all I've got for you for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you want to subscribe to my channel, click on my pretty little face just down there in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Hit the little bell, you'll get notification whenever I do anything else. And if you want to go and have a look at all the other mad and crazy things I've been doing in the past, click on my icon right here at the end of this video. Take it to my channel. I talk about photographing and filming in the forest and open forest environments. Whenever I go on adventures, I always take you with me. And when I buy cameras and camera accessories, I do reviews on them and give you my honest opinion on them. You're going to have a browser with something there of interest to you, I am sure. And just remember, if you don't do, you don't get. So get out there and start photographing, filming wildlife. And I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.